everyone's skeptical to a degree. We all have a spot that we're going to demand evidence before we believe something. And for those of you who've watched me before, you know I'm pretty skeptical, but there are people in this community that are more skeptical than myself. If you use a funnel as a metaphor, you just imagine that like the more skeptical somebody is, the smaller that funnel is and the, the less ideas get through without evidence. Now, myself, the funnel can get pretty big depending on the situation, even though I'm a pretty skeptical person. It's my intention in this video to explain to you why my funnel can get pretty large at times, and it kind of stretches out a little bit too. Hi, my name is Dan and welcome to Dunking. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as they always say, and this mentality is used to dismiss a number of things, and it's a reasonable position to hold. But there are some situations, some extraordinary circumstances, you could say, in which cases the evidence isn't just not going to show up, it's just never going to show up. And that might sound a little absurd, but if you give me a few minutes, I think that you'll see that it's actually the most likely scenario in almost every high-profile case in the alternate history community. If you assume any of these cases are true, that is, anything from the Baghdad Battery or the Crystal Skulls or the Dendera Lights all the way to the Sacred Stones Joseph Smith was said to use to decipher his golden plates, there's almost no way any of this would be in the record today. In late September of 2010, a German man was stopped at the Swiss border. With enough cash on him, he was questioned. He nonchalantly replied that he'd sold a painting. The tax man decided to investigate this white-haired art dealer, and in February of 2012, they raided his home. Over 1,300 paintings and drawings were found, all of them procured by his father during World War II. Hitler had hated modern art, and Hildebrand Gerlich was tasked with gathering up such pieces and selling them overseas for the war effort. His son, Cornelius Gerlitt, inherited a collection from his father, what was left of it after the war, and until the discovery in 2012, he'd scarcely told a soul. He sold the occasional painting here and there to make ends meet, but he kept this collection a secret, and he had almost all of it in his possession right up until it was discovered shortly before he passed away. His father had been interrogated after the war by American intelligence personnel, and Hildebrand Gerlitt claimed that the majority of the paintings had been destroyed in the Dresden firebombing. He gave a few paintings to the Americans and said, you know, this is what I got left, most of which they returned to him, and that was it. After his father duped the Americans, the majority of the collection was maintained in his son's hands until he made a sloppy answer to a question at a Swiss border checkpoint, and that unraveled the whole thing. If it wasn't for that, those paintings wouldn't have been discovered until he passed away. They were uncatalogued, unknown. This is far more common than you would think. World War II certainly led to a redistribution of art throughout Europe, and the black market dealings in antiquities and art since then has been far more robust. Still is today. And long after that, backroom dealings and looted artifacts of all types have had a strong market, with wealthy people who like to keep things secret. But what would they want in particular? What pieces would command the highest prices? How do they confirm provenance, or do they even care about that sort of thing when they're buying things on the black market? How does a seller find a buyer? These are the things that are critical when you think about this sort of stuff and when you talk about this and when you think about artifacts that might be sitting on a shelf next to a guy that's smoking his Cubans instead of cataloged in a museum somewhere. If we look to traditional and modern markets, we can see some patterns. Coolness always ranks very high and genre is also very important. Rarity matters, but only in relation to demand. And there's probably no 1992 McDonald's Monopoly tickets good for a free four-piece McNugget still left in existence, but there's probably no collectors either, so it's basically worthless. There's a supply and the demand are zero, and who cares, right? You might be able to get a buck out of it for somebody to put on a YouTube video or something. Uniqueness is where it really starts to get interesting. If you take a simple misprint on a baseball card or comic or a mint error for the coin collectors, a lot of you guys are aware of that stuff, uh, prototypes of toys, an officer owned side armed with a matching magazines and holster from a war, a marble statue that came from outside a palace as opposed to a public garden. The inability to find something equivalent to those pieces drives their prices up considerably. Now, first on the scene is another thing that is huge. Like, if you take the first appearance of the Joker in Batman comic books, it's going to be worth way more than the third appearance, even though they're both going to be from, like, the 50s or something, right? The thing is, is the difference is in that being first is, is exclusive. It's, it's special. And this goes for pretty much everything. The first Harley Davidson model is going to be worth a whole lot more than one made just a few years later. And if something rings all those bells, man, if it's like in really good condition and it's super cool and it's got the right genre that the collector wants and, and, and it's really exclusive, it's unique, it's not something they're good. Man, you start shifting decimal points. You just bzz, 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 and the prices go up, 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 up. 
Now, some collectors are happy to share their treasures with their public. Many cities have a little weird museum owned by a local eccentric guy who has a few bucks in his pocket, right? But there's also a lot of guys that just they do not want anybody to know about their collection or to be able to share what's in it. You may remember back in 2015, the Wu-Tang Clan album Escape from Shaolin making the news for being a single piece of music. One CD set was made, no digital uploads, no recordings are allowed to be made of any of the songs by the owners, and the owners are required to sign documents saying that they're never ever going to share this stuff when they purchase it. And so it is extremely exclusive. And it sold for like $2 million, man. I mean, there's, there's money in it being extremely exclusive. If you're into video game collecting, you can check out any of the sites where the prototypes are dumped. A collector will end up with a rare, unreleased, usually unfinished version of the game, and it often contains characters and levels and stuff like that that wasn't in the finished version of the game. So these can be really valuable. And because they're so rare, coupled with their value, they can get ridiculous at auction, and the community a lot of times has to contend with collectors who just buy a prototype and never tell anybody but the seller. They hide these away in some vault, I don't even know for sure, but they're happy to keep their exclusive information exclusive. Partially in fear, the company who owns the rights to it would, would come and snag it, much like a vase from Egypt, for example. Because, I mean, if you have a prototype from Microsoft, technically it is still Microsoft's property, even if it's from 1995. So there's that. But, but there is also the thing that if you keep it exclusive, you keep some value to it. Whereas if you, like, dump it out onto the Internet, nobody needs yours anymore. They, they have access to the ROM. Obviously, this extends to all manner of things, not just media. Now, I've sold a lot of things over the years, and I've seen the psychology behind collecting change, but stay the same for decades now. A rookie card is more valuable because it's first. If it's a good player, it's even more valuable, right? If the set had a low print run, that's even more valuable. If there's a misprint, even more valuable. And if it's truly a one-off, something like the Honus Wagner card, the original freaking rarest top tobacco card from back in the day, well, now those don't come up for sale very often. So when they do, you kind of just get to pick a price, right? You, if, if you're the seller, you can just say, I want $2 million, or you just don't effing get a chance at it. And somebody will probably just come along and pay it because there's a lot of people that really want that Honus Wagner card, and there's very few of them around. And frequently, the people that pay that kind of money for things want to be kept anonymous. Their collections are not listed on any pub public population report for the collectible. And when they do let people know what they own, it's just tiny little snippets of what they have. It's not their whole collection. They keep it private basically until the memory of the piece fades, usually after a generation or two before people really know about it again. And then it's liable to show up in a state sale or, or something like that. A prime example of this anonymity being important to a buyer is evident in the case of the missing Fabergé eggs. Six of the eggs made for the Russian royal family are missing. One of them has a solid record all the way up until 1952 where a jeweler in London sold it to a man who wished to remain anonymous. And now that trail's cold. It's gone forever. Another egg was presumably sold to Armand Hammer, an American businessman with deep ties to the Soviet Union and uh, deeper pockets. It's unknown for certain if he had one or not, but an egg that does semi-match the description of one that looks like he may have purchased shows up in a catalog of his possessions in the 1930s. And considering his ties to the Soviets, it's a reasonable assumption. They did sell a few eggs to raise funds back then. But that was almost 100 years ago, and it's been a long time since that egg was cataloged or touched by anyone that we're aware of. However, it may well be the case that it was purchased anonymously, perhaps even by the same buyer of the one in 1952. It's hard to say. Or consider the case of the Irish Crown Jewels. Stolen from Dublin Castle in 1909, they are very distinct, quite certain to be noticed for what they are if they're seen by anybody who knows anything about them. Yet obviously somebody wanted them very badly. For while it is possible that the pieces were broken into smaller jewels and the metals were sold as scrap, the value in the history and the risk implied in grabbing them implies that the crown jewels themselves were the target, not just jewels or profit of any sort. Like so many of the other artifacts that I've mentioned, these are almost certainly reside in somebody's private collection. Like the Fabergé eggs, their connection to royalty makes them unique, exclusive, and that's something that is really isn't easy to put a price tag on. Now personally, I've sold some things that are ridiculously rare, and sometimes those buyers, they request complete anonymity. And when that happens, that thing's lost forever now. 
I, you're never going to find that collectible again until the guy coughs it up. For, for instance, I once grabbed a Resident Evil counter standee, and it's a counter standee is just a sign that's meant to go next to like a cash register at a point of sale, right? And this is for the original Resident Evil game, and it was before it was released. It didn't even say PlayStation on it, if memory serves. It just said, coming soon, Resident Evil, and it's tiny. It was like, like that big, right? Super tiny. No zombies, no cool graphics, but it was stupid rare, and it was before the game was released. And I picked it up from a friend and uh, in, a, in a big trade of video game stuff, and um, I posted it immediately on a Facebook group that I know has is populated by whales that collect this shit, right, that I've dealt with before. And immediately I had one of those dudes emailing me, and he's offering me good money for it, and I'm like, mm, move the decimal point, buddy. And he's like, okay, just don't tell anybody what I paid. Don't tell anybody who got it. And if you go look on Google Images, you will not find that. It's gone. It, the only people that know that thing exists are me, the guy that bought it, and the people that saw me put it up for sale. I deleted the thread. It's fucking gone. So this is just one example of something that's Resident Evil. You all know what Resident Evil is, but, but, but this is gone from the record now. It, it exists. I know it does. I put it in my hands, and I could hunt up a photo of it if I looked hard enough. But it's gone from the record now because the collector requested it from the buyer, and I was more than happy, or from the seller, excuse me, and the seller was more than happy to oblige. Now imagine a collector of ancient Egyptian antiquities. Anything Old Kingdom would obviously be preferred, and the stuff relating directly to the pyramids on Giza Plateau would command even more. But what about those vases that Ben likes to talk about? Well, here's what collectors of that sort of thing have to say about Ben publicizing them. I mean, honestly, since we've done these vase videos, I know I've driven up the, like, these videos have driven up the price of vases. Yeah. You can just ask Matt, like, the guy who's been buying them, he's like, God damn it, like, he talks to these antiquities dealers like, yeah, we're getting so many inquiries about vases now. Like all the prices have doubled <laughs> or tripled for these vases that are on the market. People Dang. are generally more interested in like statues or faces, like the hieroglyphs and yeah. shit. These plain unadorned vases weren't particularly interesting for a lot of people. So they weren't very expensive. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, the more mystery and intrigue that the artifacts holds, the more value that they have and the more people are going to demand them. It's already ancient and Egyptian, but it may just be the evidence of ancient high tech, according to the true believers. So in the last few years, these vases, they've been elevated. Their cool factor has gone way up, and they've become sought after compared to a few decades before. Now, we'll basically see three types of collectors in these markets. Now, one group will be looking really hard to prove Ben right. They're the true believers, and they're going to be valuing precision really highly as a result. The more symmetrical it looks, the more they're going to pay in the hopes of proving it's truly precise. The next group will be looking to turn a profit, buying the vases that they think they can sell for the most money. So they're, they're going to be looking at precision too, but they're going to be looking less at that than looking at, at, at what other, how they can make money, where they can buy low and sell high. So precision is going to matter less than where they can buy low and sell high. Vases weren't particularly interesting for a lot of people, so they weren't very expensive. And Damn, you, we missed out on an exit a strategy. Huge mistake, me, I right? definitely not did. buying bases oh. before publishing these videos. Yeah, fuck me, I've I've kicked my own ass so hard over the last year because of that. I'm like, I so I so should have bought a few vases and then tried to sell them because. For example, you got guys like Ben's friend Adam Young who've been buying a lot of these vases over the years, and now that Ben's scans have gone public, the value of his collection has definitely increased a lot, and so. He's made a lot of money here as a speculator, and I'm not saying that, that that he's got no interest in it. I mean, the man could be speculating in thimbles, right? But he's he's chosen these vases. But his true passion seems to be more into he, he only needs one or two to prove what he needs, right? But but getting twenty of the things, and now 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 you're starting to look like a dealer. Uh, I've been to Egypt with Chris as well as as Robert Schock and some others, and um, had the pleasure of first going there a little over 10 years ago and saw some of the precision in, I think, some of the largest structures and some of the smallest ones. In a museum, behind plexiglass, even online in photographs, you can really recognize uh, you know, the, the extensive precision of work that must have went into yeah. to, to creating these. And so, you know, for the past, I'd say, seven, eight, nine years, uh, my wife and I have been kind of looking for anytime we see artifacts through through dealers or um, or private collectors that are for sale, we take a look. And if it looks like it might be pre-dynastic or impressive in some way, um, 
you know, we, we have been accumulating some of these things. So yeah, awesome. we probably have, we probably have 40 or 50. Um, they're not all as precise as the red or the rose granite vase that we, that, that Alex and um, his colleagues took a look at a few years back. Now the third group is the ones that really make it hard to discern the truth from fictions at times, but it also allows speculation all this room to exist. These are the people that hide what they find and they don't share their info with anyone. If they do scans and they find out that it's precise, they're not going to say anything. If they look and find out that it's not precise, they're not going to say anything. It's most likely just going to sit on a shelf next to a bunch of other cool stuff and get pointed out to other rich people and never be seen by anyone that would catalog it or talk about it. Whether they believe that the vases are truly precise or have a spiritual or historical belief that the vases are part of or just for the feeling of having power over something sought after by someone else is satisfying to them, these people will silently buy them, won't speak about them to anybody they don't trust, and they'll keep these vases from the public. Fear of Egypt collecting their looted artifacts certainly plays a role, but that's not the only factor here. Now imagine if someone you found something truly unique, something truly out of place, something truly groundbreaking. For example, something simple like the bracelet Garcilaso de la Vega described in his world commentaries of the Incas. The fire used for this sacrifice had to be fresh, or as they said, given to them by the hand of the sun. For this they took a large bracelet, belonging to the high priest, and similar in form to that usually worn on their left wrist by the Incas. The central motif of this bracelet was a very carefully polished concavity as big as half an orange. They turned this to the sun to capture its rays, which they then concentrated on a small wisp of very dry fluffy cotton that caught fire instantly. Now nothing is like this has ever been found in any of the artifacts that were recovered and any of the ones that were stolen. I mean, perhaps it's in the bottom of a cenote somewhere, or perhaps it's on the shelf of some rich European family and has been for a long time, or perhaps it was melted down back in the day. We'll never know for sure. But that possibility of it being on a rich dude's shelf and having been for hundreds of years is very real, especially when it's a piece like that. If it's a fancy bracelet that was owned by a high priest, that's exactly the kind of thing that a rich collector is going to want. For example, a guy like the 8th Girl of Pembroke, a man known for collecting antiquity to the point he became something of a laughing stock amongst the poor. He spent absurd amounts of wealth on statues, paintings, and coins and was known to buy everything from uncatalogued lots of antiquities to select pieces that he would pay ridiculous sums of money for. He was so heavily mocked for his collecting, he was mentioned by name in a letter deriding the art collectors of the day. He buys for Topham, drawings and designs, for Pembroke, statues, dirty gods and coins, rare bookish manuscripts from her and alone, and books for Mead and butterflies for Sloan. Those were all different rich guys from back in the day that collected different things. And that sentiment was not alone. There was a play called Taste that was written in 1752 poking fun of collectors like the Earl. It gained popularity as the trope of eccentric antiquities collectors grew. This in turn created a desire for some collectors to keep their collections under wraps even more. Show their stuff to the people they knew were into it, but keeping the public from knowing. Proxy buyers and private deals became far more popular at this point and those things continue to this day. But one more important thing worth mentioning is the spiritualism resurgence of the early 20th century. Now Napoleon's conquest had made Egypt famous again and the work of early Egyptologists was ongoing throughout much of the 19th century with the antiquities market exploding alongside the interest in ancient Egypt. Much of this was intertwined with spirituality. The idea the ancient Egyptians knew something about the afterlife we don't is still popular today and was extremely popular back in those days. And the questions posed by early excavators frequently led to answers considered outside the norm, especially by modern standards. But in the 1920s, spiritualism took off again. Characters like Edgar Cayce, Alistair Crowley, and hundreds of mediums like Ada Bassinet popularized the idea of spiritualism. This zeitgeist is what inspired Houdini to perform the tricks that he did, or so that they say, to debunk a lot of the stuff and to show that it was just humans being tricky. Edgar Cayce's writings on Atlantis and Egypt captivated the public yet again, and as a result, everything Egyptian got a kind of a second wind in the 1920s in the spiritualism circles in particular. But in 1922, King Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered and excavated, and with it came the mummy's curse myth, and then the team did experience a few deaths, supposedly, and that just fed into everything. So you had the regrowth of spiritualism, the mummy's curse, this brand new tomb that had all the crap still in there for a change it just kind of created this perfect storm for the collector's market to be like heavily influenced by spiritualism 
Now, this extends to other cultures that have some New Age spiritual collections. They are going to have collectors who are going to want to own a piece for esoteric reasons. So if an artifact were to show up that was groundbreaking, like, say, a Baghdad battery that had all the pieces that you needed to make it actually work, or even the aforementioned bracelet with the concave area for starting fires, collectors with deep pockets would be paying insane amounts of money to get these things and would go through all kinds of problems and jump through all kinds of hoops to make sure that they got to keep them. Even if that meant pissing on the providence a little bit and lying about things or maybe who knows it could even get worse or take the case of utah in the four corners area where they've had a lot of problems with looting over the years of artifacts i mean they call it pot hunting and they say that it's become ingrained in the local culture to the point where it's just kind of something you go do is go running around out in the desert and poking around and, and looking for native american artifacts and stuff um, by some reports, by 1979, the, the, up to half of the sites in that area had already been corrupted by people. And the, uh, they, they made laws about this, and by the 80s, they were starting to crack down on it a little bit. But every time they would make any busts or anything, they really wouldn't get anywhere. They wouldn't make any arrests. They wouldn't really push anything. And this changed a little bit in the mid 2000s. They got a guy that uh, they they got uh, busted and got him to roll on his buddies, and he did undercover wire work for a couple of years. And during the course of that, he got a lot of incriminating evidence on a lot of people. And when it was done, there was like the brother of a sheriff and a school teacher and like local businessmen and doctors and stuff. Like well-to-do people were involved in the trade of over 40,000 antiquities that were gathered. And this this happened about 15 years ago. Um, and this was quite a big deal in the region. It caused a couple of people, of, of the prominent people, to... Um, decide to check out of the video game they were playing if you follow me and uh, it, it was which made it really bad and and uh, as far as the local people's consideration of the thing went because the community is very divided again a lot of them are already this is what we do we go look for arrowheads and pots out in the desert and a lot of the other half of the community is like yeah but that's illegal and we all know it's illegal and we've been trying to stop it for a long time and finally somebody's doing something and um Anyway, it's created quite a disturbance in the community. It, it, it's quite this big hoopla over these stolen artifacts that were part of the community and not just part of the community's uh, identity, but I would dare say part of their livelihood. 40,000 artifacts in the hands of a lot of businessmen and stuff. This isn't all just ending up on local shelves. This stuff's getting shipped all over the world. And that makes sense, because if you go back to the 1890s, this area was targeted pretty heavily back in those days. They, there was this thing called, like, the end of the noble savage or some crap like that. I forget exactly what it was called. But, but because so many people had passed away of indigenous descent, there was a push by a lot of antiquitarians and, like, um, the archaeologists and the anthropologists of the time. They were, they were starting to get big on, like, uh, grabbing the remains of the material culture. So this got really big into them actually paying money for pots. And they were being shipped all over the world at this point. Not just pots, but that's kind of a colloquial term in the area, apparently. And that created an environment where people were constantly looking for these things because it was some money. They, were, they, they have value. And with that, becomes you know it becomes part of the culture. You know, you go out again and go out in the desert with your kids and look for these things. It, it becomes very difficult to remove that, to, to tell somebody that's bad or that's wrong can be very very difficult and we're dealing with that as it sits but with the money tied into it it just has become this problem that's multi-layered so something like an original aliophile for example the steam engine toy written about in ancient roman accounts if it was to show up in a dig the attempts to procure that piece would be ridiculously insurmountable the money that would be thrown at it would be so much that archaeologists even if you assume that they're all incorruptible there's plenty of people who aren't like in 1990, when 13 paintings were stolen from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and these were worth millions, none have been recovered, and it's a pretty safe assumption that the job was paid for by a private collector who wanted those paintings. All right, to get down to brass tacks, let's talk about the Schist disc for a second. It's this disc that looks like a fan, that looks uncannily like a fan from a modern machine, and it's considered by many to be the kind of the quintessential out-of-place artifact. Now, just imagine if it went up for auction. Imagine how stupid the money they got thrown at that thing would be. It would be like up there on the level if, if like a mummy went up for auction. You're talking supremely unique. Lots and lots and lots of people want it. High cool factor, all the mysteriousness and stuff. 
it would go for stupid amounts of money. You'd have everyone from Graham Hancock to Jimmy Corsetti to Ben Van Kerwick trying to buy it, but there would be those private collectors that would be willing to pay far more and they would be known to the sellers already. These guys would be willing to pay a premium just to keep the transaction under wraps and would probably have been contacted long before the public was even made aware that the thing was available. The deal would be struck and then the antiquity just happens to be shipped improperly like Zahi Hawass apparently did with some other artifacts in the 2010s and, and, then, and then it would just turn up missing and then it's lost forever. Like the Quartara Rezu icon, a painting of Christ that was looted by the British expedition in the mid-1800s. It was part of a huge collection, officially stolen at the time, cataloged, and it just happened to go missing. It's been gone ever since. I'm sure it didn't get used as toilet paper. I'm sure it was sold to a rich person and is still sitting in a collection somewhere, uncatalogued, unreferenced, unknown, sitting on a list of missing antiquities, and that's it. Something that a guy shows off to his friends when he smokes his illegal cigars. <laughs> and those collectors, they have their eyes on the pieces with the qualities that I mentioned earlier, and they're waiting for an opportunity, and they jump when a chance presents itself. Like the Hope Diamond, which was known as the French Blue before the French Revolution. While Keynes were being beheaded, there were thieves looting the crown jewels, and most of those were recovered, but not the Hope Diamond. It's got this weird, goofy history of being recut and all kinds of stuff. There were people waiting on the wings to grab that thing. They saw the opportunity and they leapt in there and procured it. A similar thing happened to Nicolas Cage. He used to own a copy of Action Comics number no. one, which is the first appearance of Superman. It's actually the first superhero comic book ever. And his was like one of the top five as far as condition goes ever, is graded and in really good shape and it was stolen. Disappeared in I think 2002 and 2000. And it turned up in 2011 in the storage locker. Shortly afterwards, it became the highest grossing comic of all time. It sold for over $2 million. Sadly, this is how the market works. So if we assume the schist disc, for example, was part of an ancient machine, and tomorrow a dig turned up another disc, but it was attached to more parts of that machine, I don't think it would make the news. I think it would almost certainly be sold for a ridiculous amount of money before anyone even had a chance to look at it. And this goes for a lot of things, like, for example, crystal skulls, even though the ones that we have in the record were pretty certain were made with modern tools. Like 20% of you said in the poll that I had, you know, that doesn't mean that, that, that there wasn't an original made by Incas or Olmecs or Mayas with old school tools. It's just that the modern ones are the ones that we have in the record. A rich guy could well have the original on his shelf. If, if there is an original, that's almost for certain where it is. If you look at things from this perspective, the late 19th and early 20th century newspaper reports and Smithsonian accounts claiming that they had giant bones and they were being shipped to the Smithsonian, it might just be a clever way to advertise what they had for sale. Seven foot, eight foot, that's not really giant, but sounds pretty big. It's going to be hard to, to, to replace. It's going to be unique. It's going to be a one-off type of thing. Who's got the biggest bones in the new world. Well, in my opinion, there's a really good chance that that was just a clever way for whoever had those bones in their possession to announce to the people that they were trying to sell it to, hey guys, look what we got over here. Because, all right, which one of these makes more sense to you? The Smithsonian, a group of scientists are hiding these giant bones to forge a narrative, or some rich dude bought the bones and doesn't want the Smithsonian to come and grab them and shove them back in their museum. So he's just sitting on them and, you know, they're, they're 7.2 inches, you know, 7 feet 2 inches tall. That makes a whole lot more sense to me. Now, of course, some exceptions exist, but even these can prove the rule. For example, the Antikythera mechanism was discovered in 1901 in the shipwreck. And it was discovered alongside, like, traditional treasures of, like, jewelry and statues and stuff. And it wasn't until much, much later that it was recognized as a complicated set of gears. Had it been recognized as such when it was first discovered, I don't think that it would have seen the light of day. I think it would have ended up on a private collector's shelf. As a matter of fact, if the opportunity to procure this thing by less than legal opportunities were to present itself right now, I have no doubt in my mind that there is multiple people that are waiting there looking for an opportunity to grab that thing and are willing to pay stupid amounts of money to have it. That sadly seems to be just the way that this, the collectible community is. So, 
my point here is you kind of there is a lot of wiggle room if you have a justification in believing something did exist obviously you can't in my opinion you can't just say we'll use this and be like well it, it exists and it's on a collector's shelf but if you're like well you know i really think that this did exist there's you know it the exclusion of the artifact from existence in the record does not mean it doesn't exist. As a matter of fact, the coolest shit will almost never be in the record. It's going to be on a rich dude's shelf somewhere with some rare exceptions. Now, special thanks to my patrons. You make this a lot easier and give me confidence. I have a two and a five dollar tier. Um, either way, you get to like uh, get early access to my videos like, like they did here. And um, yeah, thank you guys very much and I hope to see you next time.